Today we are going to talk about a subdomain of question answering called long form question answering. Now before we get into the specifics, let's just talk very quickly about question answering as a subdomain of NLP. Question answering has I think exploded as a subdomain of NLP in the past few years, mainly because I think question answering is an incredibly widely applicable use case for NLP, but it wasn't possible to do question answering or not anything good with question answering until we had transform models like BERT. So uh, that means that as soon as we got something like BERT, the question answering became viable and with the huge number of use cases for question answering, it obviously kind of took off. Now, question answering is quite complicated, but at its core, it's basically just the retrieval of information in a more human-like way. And when we consider this, I think it makes it really clear how broadly applicable question answering is because almost every organization in the world, if not all, are going to need to retrieve information, right? And for a lot of companies and particularly large organizations, I think the act of information retrieval is actually a big component of their day-to-day -day operations. Now, at the moment, most organizations do inf information retrieval across a suite of tools. So they will have people um, using some sort of internal search tools, which are typically keyword based, which is generally not always that helpful. Sometimes it's, it's useful, but a lot of the time um, it's, it's not great. And then another key form of information retrieval in most organizations is literally person to person. So you go and ask someone who you think will probably know where some information is, like a document or so on. And obviously, you know, this sort of patchwork of information retrieval, to an extent, sure it works, but it's inefficient. Now, if we consider that many organizations contain thousands of employees, each of those employees producing pages upon pages of unstructured data, e.g. pages of documents and text that are meant for human consumption. In most cases, all of that information is just being lost in some sort of void, okay? And rather than that information being lost in a void that we're never going to see again, and it becomes useless to the organization or the company, we can instead place it in a database that a question and answering agent has access to. And when we ask a question to that Q&A agent, which we ask in a human-like way, it will go and retrieve the relevant information for us instantly. Or well, not instantly, but pretty close. The majority of data in the world is unstructured. And there's a few different sources for this, but I think Places like Forbes estimate that number to be around 90% of the world's data. So in your organization, you probably have a number similar to this. So 90% of your data is unstructured. That means it's meant for human consumption, not machines. And it means it's liable to get lost in that void uh, where we're just never gonna see that information ever again. Now that's massively inefficient. Question answering, is an opportunity to not lose that and actually benefit from that information. Now, in question answering, there are two main approaches. In both cases of question answering, we saw those documents in, or, or usually we saw those documents in a document store or vector database. So these documents are what we would call sentences or paragraphs um, extracted from your, uh, for example, PDFs or emails or whatever unstructured data you have out there. And we retrieve data from that and 
Then the next step is where we have the two different forms of question answering. With that relevant information that we have uh, from our sort of document sort, based on a query that we've give, passed through there, we either generate an answer or we extract an answer. So obviously when we're generating an answer, we look at the whole, uh, all of the context that we've retrieved and we uh, use an NLP model to generate some sort of human answer to um, our query based on that information. Otherwise, we use an extractive model, which is literally going to take a snippet of information from the data that we have retrieved. So there's a few components that I just described there. There is that document store at the start. When we're using a document store, which we will in most cases, I'd imagine, we call that open book question answering. Now, the reason it's called open book is it is like students in an exam. Okay, we have a typical exam. You don't have any outside materials to refer to. It's just you have to rely on what is in your brain. That's very similar to uh, using, for example, a generator model that given a question, it doesn't refer to any document store. It just refers to what is within its own memory or its own model memory. And that model memory has been built during model training. So that would be referred to as closed book, um, generative or abstractive Q&A. On the other hand, we have a document store. So that document store is like we are in our exam as students and we have a open book that we can refer to for information. So we're not just relying on what is in our head, but we're looking at the information in this book and we still need to rely on the knowledge in our head in order to apply what is in that book to the questions we're given in the exam. It's exactly the same for open book abstractive question answering in that you have the generator model, but we're not just relying on a generator model to answer our questions. We are also relying on a document store, which is our book and what is called a retrieval model. And this retrieval model is going to take our question. It will encode it into a vector embedding, takes it to that document store, which is actually just a vector database in, in our scenario of what we're doing. And in a vector database, what you have is lots of other uh, vector embeddings, which are essentially numerical representations of the documents that you stored in it before. So remember documents are those chunks of paragraph or sentences uh, from different sources. That vector database has loads of these um, these what we call context vectors. And we pass our query vector into that document store or vector database, and we retrieve the most similar context vectors from there and pass them back to our sort of retrieval pipeline. Then that is passed to our generator model. Our generator model is going to see the query followed by the set of retrieved relevant, hopefully, context. And it uses all of that to generate an answer. Okay, so we can see with this open book format, uh, we are passing a lot more information into the generator, which allows the generator to answer more specific questions. Now, long form question answering, which is what we are going to go through, is one form of this abstractive question answering. The only difference with, or the, the one thing that makes long form question answering, long form question answering, is that the generator model has been trained to produce a multi-sentence output. So rather than just outputting a maybe an answer of three or four words or one sentence, it is going to try and output a full paragraph um, answer to you. Okay, so that's long form question answering or LFQA. So we are going to implement LFQA in Haystack. And Haystack is a very popular NLP library, uh, mainly for question answering. 
Now to install Haystack and the other libraries that we need. Um, today we do this. So we have a pip install. Uh, we need the uh, pinecone client, farm Haystack, specify pinecone in there, data sets and pandas. Actually, I think you can ignore pandas. Let's remove that. So just these three here. Uh, with farm Haystack, we are going to be using something called a pinecone document store. So for that, you need either version 1.3 or above. Now to initialize that pinecone document store, so remember the document store is that thing that you saw on the right before, so the, where we're storing all of our context vectors, we will do this. So we first need an API key uh, from pinecone. So there's a link here, I'll just open it and show you quickly. And that will bring you to this page here. Now you can sign up for free. You don't have to, you don't need to pay for anything and we don't need to pay for anything to do what we're doing here either. It's all completely free. So you just sign up. And once you've signed up, you will see, it should just be one project on your homepage. So for me, it is the default project, James's default project. So you can go into that. And then on the left over here, we have API keys. So we open that and we get our default API key. We can just copy it. So we come over here and we use that to authenticate our Pinecone document store back in our code. So I would paste that here. And with that, we just run this. So we are initializing our document store. We are calling our index. So Remember document store is actually a vector database in this case. And inside that vector database, we have what is called an index. The index is basically the list of all the context vectors that we have. We call that index Haystack LFQA. Now you can call it whatever you want. Just when you are wanting to load this document store again, you need to specify the correct index. That's all, that's, all. that's the only difference it makes. Similarity, we're using cosine similarity and we're using embedding dimensions 768. Now, it's important to align this to whatever the similarity metric and embedding dimension of your retriever model is. In our case, cosine and 768. These are pretty typical retriever model um, metrics and dimensionalities. Now we can go down, we can check our metric type. We can also see the number of documents and the embeddings that we have in there. Now, uh, we don't have any at the moment because we haven't pushed anything to our document store. Uh, we don't have any data, so we need to get some data. For that, we are going to use Hugging Face data sets. So over here, we're going to use this data set here, which is a set of snippets from Wikipedia. There are a lot of them in full. This data set is nine gigabytes. Now to avoid downloading this full data set, what we do is set streaming equal to true. And what this will do is allow us to iteratively load one record at a time from this data set. And we can check what we have inside that data set by running this. So next, we create a iterable from our data set and we see this. So the main things to take note of here are section title and passage text. Passage check text is going to create our context or that sort of document. And there are a couple of other things. So history is going to be what we are going to filter for in our data set. This is a very big data set and I don't want to process all of it. So I'm restricting our scope to just history and we're going to only return a certain number of records from that section. That's important to us purely for that filtering out of other um, sections or, or um, titles in there, section titles. And we'll, we will include article title as metadata in our documents, although it's not really important because we're not actually going to use it. It's just so you can see how you would include metadata in there in case you did want to use it. So here, what we're doing is filtering only for documents 
that have the section title history. Okay. And we just get this iterable object uh, because we're streaming. So it just knows now when we're streaming one by one, uh, when it's pulling an object, it's going to check if that object section title starts with history. If it does, it will, it will pull it. If not, it will move on to the next one. Okay, so we're just going to pull those with history. Now what we need to do is process those and add them to our document store. Now, what I've done here is said, okay, we are only going to pull 50,000 of those and no more. At that point, we, we cut off. And it's actually, it cuts off just before 50,000. And what we're going to do is we're going to add in a single batch. So we're going to loop through all of, or we're going to pull all of these records. We're going to collect 10,000 of them, and then we're going to add them to our document store. And this is a haystack document object. So we have a content. The content is the document text, that big paragraph you saw before. Meta is any metadata that we'd like to add in there. Now, with the Pinecone document store, we can use metadata filtering, although I won't show you how to do that here, uh, but that can be really useful if it's something you're interested in. So that's how you'd add metadata to your document as well. And all I'm doing is create adding that doc to a docs list. And we increase the counter. And once the counter hits the batch size, which is the 10,000, we write those documents to our document store. Now, you will remember I said the document store is a vector database and inside the vector database we have vectors. At the moment, when we write those documents, we're not actually creating those vectors because we haven't specified the retriever model yet. We're going to do that later. So at the moment, what we're doing is kind of adding the documents as just plain text to um, almost be ready to be processed into vectors to put into that vector database. So it's almost like they're in limbo, waiting to be added um, to, our, to our database. So we add all of those. That can take a it can take a little bit of time, not not too long though. Uh, and then once we hit or get close to fifty thousand, we break. So we stop the loop. And then we can see if we get the document tap count, we see that we have the almost fifty thousand documents in there. But then when we look at the embedding count, zero. And that's because we you know they're waiting to be added into the vector database those um, the text documents. So they are, exist as documents, they just don't exist as embeddings yet. Okay, so uh, what we now need to do is convert those documents into vector embeddings. Now, to do that, we need a retriever model. Now, uh, at this point, it's probably best to check if you have a GPU that uh, is available, like a CUDA-enabled GPU. If you don't, this set will take longer, unfortunately. Uh, but if you do, that's great because this will be pretty quick in most cases, depending on your GPU, of course. So we initialize our retriever model. So we're using the embedding retriever, and this allows us to use what are called sentence transformer models from the sentence transformers library. Now. I'm using this model here, and we can find all the sentence transform models over on the Hugging Face model hub. So let's have a quick look at that. So we are here, huggingface.co slash models, and I can paste that model name. Maybe I just do flex sentence embeddings. Now, flex sentence embeddings are a set of models that were trained on a lot of data using the flex library, but there are a lot of other sentence transform models. You see the one we're using here. So for example, if we go sentence transformers, you will see all of the default models used by the sentence transformers library. So we are using this MPNet model. Uh, we also specify that we're using sentence transformers model format. And when we initialize our retriever, we also need to add the document store that we'll be retrieving documents from. So we've already initialized our document source, so we just add that in there. And 
at this point, it's time for us to update those embeddings. So when we say update embeddings, what this is going to do is look at any all of the documents that are sort of ready and with your document store, and it's going to use the retriever model that you pass here and embed them into vector representations of those contents. And then it's going to store those in your Pinecone vector database. That will be processed. And at this point, we could run this get embedding count again, and we would get this 49995 value. Now, another way that you can also see this number is if we go back to our Pinecone dashboard, we can head over to our index, so Haystack LFQA. We click on that, scroll down, and we can click on index info, and then we can see the total number of vectors, which is the same. Okay, so that will that number will be reflected in your vector database once you have updated the embeddings using a retriever model. Okay, and at that point we can just test the first part of our LFQA uh, pipeline, which is just a document sort and a retriever. So we initialize this document search pipeline with our retriever model, and we can ask the question, uh, when is the first electric power system built? Okay, and all this is going to do is retrieve the relevant context. It's not going to generate an answer yet. It's just going to retrieve what it thinks is the, is the relevant context. So we have here uh, electrical power system in 1881, two electricians built the world's first power system in Goldeming in England, which is pretty good. So that's pretty cool. And what we now need to do is we have our document store or vector database, and then we have our retriever model. Now we need to initialize our generator model to actually generate those answers. So we come down here, we are going to be using a sequence to sequence generator. And we are going to be using this model here. So this again, you can find this on the hugging face uh, model hub. And there are different generator models you can use here, but you do want to find one that has been trained for long form question answering. So for example, we have the bar LFQA uh, that you can find here, or you have the bot explain like I'm five model uh, that we can find here. Now, I think the bar LFQA model seems to perform better. So we have gone with that. Also, it's been trained with a newer uh, data set. And yeah, we just initialize it like that. Now, when we say sequence to sequence, that's because it is taking in a sequence of characters or some some input and it's going to output a sequence of characters eg the output the, the answer and if you are curious that the input will look something like what you see here okay so we have the question and then we have the user's query it's followed by context and then we have this sort of p token here and that p token um, indicates to the model the start of a new context that has been retrieved from our document store so in this case, we've retrieved three contexts and all of that is being passed to the generator model uh, where it will then generate an answer based on all of that. Okay, so yeah, that we just initialized that the generator model and then we initialize a generative Q&A pipeline. We pass in the generator and the retriever model. We don't need to include document store here because the document store has already been passed to the retriever model when we're initializing that. So it's almost like it's embedded within the retriever. So we don't need to worry about adding that in there. And then we can begin asking questions. Now this is where it starts to get, I think, more interesting. Now, one thing to make note of here is we have this top K parameter and that's just saying how many uh, contexts to retrieve in, in the context of our uh, retriever model and then for the generator how many answers to generate so in this case we're retrieving uh, three contexts and then we are generating one answer based on the query and those three contexts like we saw in the example so in this i'm asking what is the wall of currents it's good to be specific 
um, to test this. And if we have the data within our, our data set, it's, it seems to be pretty good at pulling that out and producing a, a relatively accurate answer. So the war occurrence was a rivalry between Thomas Edison and George Westinghouse's companies over which form of transmission DC or AC was superior. Okay, that's the answer, which is pretty cool. And we can see what it's pulled that from. So it's pulled it from this content, this content, and this content. Okay, so there were the three um, parts that got fed into the into the model and that's that's good we can see a lot of information there but maybe we can see a little bit too much information so we can actually use the print answers utility to minimize what we're outputting them and here we get uh, just this which is obviously a lot easier to read so we just pass our result into print answers and specify details of minimum uh, the rest of that is the same as what we asked before Okay, so it's much more readable. Now, one thing to point out here is that this is actually a very good answer, but maybe there's not that much detail. Now, if we find that we're not getting much detail in our answers or that the answer is just wrong, what the issue might be is first, the retrieved context may not contain any relevant information for the model to actually uh, view and answer the question correctly. Okay, so it's not retrieving relevant information from that external um, sort of open book document source. And the second is, uh, if it's not also not retrieving information from there, and it's also not retrieving information from, you remember I mentioned that these models can have a memory, if it's not able to find any relevant information within its memory for your particular query. Uh, if both of those conditions are um, not satisfied, so we don't have information or relevant information coming from the external source and we don't have relevant information coming from the model memory, the generator is going to output usually something nonsensical. Okay, so in this scenario, we have two options really. To generate a model, we can increase its size. So we can use a, a larger generator model because larger generator models have more uh, model parameters, which means they have basically more memory that they have learned during training. Or we can increase the amount of data that we are pulling from the document store. Okay, so if we are just returning three uh, documents or contexts, we can increase it to 10 because then the generator is being fed a lot more information and it might be that the correct um, information that we need may come in maybe context five or context six and nine. And the generator will see that and be like, okay, that's the answer. I'm going to you know, reformulate this into a into my answer okay so we can try that here now we already got a good answer but we can just see what we get if we increase uh, the retriever so all the retrieved number of documents so we increase that to 10 and we see that we get this much longer chunk of text now and i think the first half of this is relatively accurate so we have uh, this in 1891 first power system it was installed in the United States. I think that's relatively, relatively correct. Um, and then it starts to get a little bit silly after that because, you know, we've pulled more context from our, our document store, uh, but with that, we have pulled in more irrelevant information because we're, we're retrieving 10 now. So there's a good chance that the last few of those are not relevant. So we're feeding a lot of irrelevant information into our generator model. And so it starts to get confused and then it can start to ramble uh, like we like we see here. So that's what we see happening. Um, another thing I just want to point out is that the generator has this memory. So a lot of people 
always think when they hear, okay, the generator has memory, does that mean I don't need the document store? Because we, we have this memory, can't I just fine tune the model so that it knows everything within my particular use case? In some cases, yes, you might be able to do that, but it generally only works for more sort of general uh, questions or, or general knowledge. If you start to get specific, it tends to fail with that sort of memory part because the memory can only store so much information. And in the end, what you will probably need is you want a, a model with good memory so it can kind of maybe pull out some facts from there. Uh, but for anything specific, it's probably going to need to refer to its document store. So what we have done here is we've asked the same question, uh, but this time I've replaced the retrieved documents with just nothing. And uh, we can see the result of that straight away. So uh, the answer is, I'm not sure what you mean by war. <laughs> so it's it, it has no idea what the war of currents is. It doesn't have that information within its memory. So without that external document, uh, source it it doesn't know what to say it's just okay I, I don't even know what war is um, but like I said in some cases particularly when you're asking a more general knowledge query it will be able to pull that out from its memory so uh, who was the first person on the moon it it knows this because it's it's such a common thing to know it's probably seen it in the training data that the model has been trained on a million times Maybe not a million, but a few times at least. So uh, that is the first person man to walk on the moon was Neil Armstrong. Okay, cool. So I think that's pretty much it. We can ask a few more questions. Uh, when was the first electrical power system built? So we asked this near to start and it will give us this answer. Um, if we want to confirm that this is correct. So this is what I did with this. I was a bit confused because Google is telling me something different. Uh, you can print out the contents using this. So we loop through the result uh, documents and we just print dot content. And this, okay, so two electricians built first uh, power system at Gold Damming in England. So that information is actually coming from somewhere. It's not just making it up. So. That can be really useful. Another thing uh, just to be aware of with generators is that they can generate misleading uh, information. Um, so you need to be careful with that. So for example, in this one, uh, I asked, where did COVID-19 originate? Now this is pretty unfair because the generator probably hasn't seen anything about COVID-19. And at the same time, it doesn't have any COVID-19 information within its uh, document store because we looked at history, not, not anything else. Um, so it just says COVID-19 isn't a virus, which it is, it's a bacterium. Okay, so straight away, it's pretty, pretty wrong. So it's just one example of where you need to just be cautious with this sort of thing because it can just give completely wrong answers if it doesn't have the relevant information available to it. So with that, uh, th there's a couple of things you could do to mitigate that. You can, one, just include the sources of information. If you, I don't know, if you build some sort of search interface, make sure you include those so users can look at that and see where this information is coming from. And two, uh, there are sort of confidence scores that are, are given to these answers. So you could put a threshold like so you say anything be below 0 0.2 confidence, we just don't show or we show. Um, I'm not confident in this answer, but it might be this or something along those lines. Okay, so that's just one drawback. Um, let's, we'll just go through a few final questions. So what was NASA's most expensive project? I would say the space shuttle project, um, that's correct. Tell me something interesting about the history of the Earth. In this case, it really, it's nothing, it's not really history, I don't think. Um, but it does give us a, an interesting fact about the magnetic field being weak compared to the rest of the solar system. I don't know if that's true or not. It seems like it might not be. When it says compared to the rest of the solar system, I'm thinking, is it weak compared to Mars? I don't think so. So um, that might not be true. Another thing to be wary of. Who created the Nobel Prize and why? So this one is correct, and I think 
quite interesting. And how is the Nobel Prize funded? Uh, we kind of see it down here, so I know the information is in there, hence why I've asked the question. And it, it tells you that as well, with a little bit more information. So, that is it for long form question answering with Haystack. As I said at the start, I think question answering is one of the most widely applicable forms of NLP or use cases of NLP. It, it can be applied almost everywhere. So it's a really good one to just sort of go away and see, you know, maybe I can implement like document search in my organization or I can create some sort of internal search engine <laughs> that helps people in some way. And I think in a lot of organizations, it's very uh, possible to do this and add a lot of benefit and reduce a lot of friction in day-to-day uh, -day processes of most companies. So that's it for this video. I hope it's been useful and I will see you in the next one.